Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. I am really looking forward to speaking with one of our graduates, Dr. Suzanne Bartlett Hackenmiller, and uh, we're going to be talking about Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing. Uh, what a wonderful concept, you know, just spending time in forests and letting its influences watch over you. Yes, I actually had an opportunity uh, to have a forest bathing, although I should probably say a desert bathing ah. <laughs> experience with Suzanne when she was in Tucson in January before we had to stay socially distant. Uh, and it was really quite wonderful. Before we jump into this episode, we want to answer a question we received from a listener. And Andy, he has a question for you about foraging for mushrooms. I was just listening to the episode with Paul Stamets and was curious what wild mushroom harvesting can be done in Tucson specifically. And I think it was morels that, that appear after forest fires. So with the recent fires, are there a possibility of possible fungal growth that could be harvested for eating? And if someone's a beginner, um, how would they go about having someone they could go with to learn uh, what mushrooms to pick and not. Well, I wouldn't do that unless you uh, are with a knowledgeable expert. You know, um, it's hard to use books to guide you to mushrooms, but if you find people who know them, that's really the best way. Um, there are people who know mushrooms in the Tucson area. I, I believe there is an Arizona Mycological Society that you could check with. Um, the desert is not the best place for mushrooms. Uh, but And there are odd mushrooms that come up on the desert floor when we've had a lot of rain, but most of them are not anything you want to eat. Uh, the best foraging that I have found is on Mount Lemon uh, after good summer rain, so usually July. And there's so quite a variety of mushrooms that grow in mixed aspen conifer woods. Um, and uh, uh, you usually can't find them in great quantity, but uh, it's possible to get King Valites up there um, and, you know, other, other mushrooms that are fairly easy to find. But my main advice would be to go with somebody who knows the mushrooms. Thanks, Andy. Uh, and remember, you can call and submit questions for us or for our upcoming guests. So it's my pleasure to introduce our listeners to Dr. Suzanne Bartlett Hackenmiller. Suzanne's an OBGYN and also a fellowship graduate of the University of Arizona Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. In addition, she holds certifications in herbal medicine, and she's a certified forest therapy guide. She's also the medical director for the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy and is a medical advisor for all trails. She wrote a wonderful book that has won awards called The Outdoor Adventurer's Guide to Forest Bathing. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you, Victoria. Such an honor to be here with you both. Well, we're delighted. Andy, I want to start with you. I'm wondering if you could just begin by talking about the importance of creating a relationship with nature. Well, as you know, there's a, a condition that's been talked about recently called nature deficit disorder. Um, and this especially applies to kids who were raised on devices and indoor spaces. And uh, the feeling is that disconnection from nature really undermines emotional and mental wellness. I think that's true. There also there is research, for example, showing that patients who've had surgery, uh, who have a hospital room that has a window, recover faster than those who don't. So you know we have a lot of information like that. And this idea of forest bathing—it's such a wonderful term. And I know uh, there's a Japanese word for it, for it, and the J Japanese were some of the first folks to research it, called Shinrin Yoku. But Suzanne. Tell our listeners, what is forest bathing? Yes, I get a lot of questions about this, although fewer and fewer all the time now. It's, the term has started to be a little more well-known. Uh, but forest bathing is a literal translation from the Japanese term shinrin yoku, which was coined in the early 80s in Japan by a couple of doctors, Dr. Lee and Dr. Miyazaki, who recognized that people in Japan 
were extremely stressed out, had very high levels of mental illness and very high suicide rates. And so they wondered if perhaps they just took these people out into nature about an hour outside of the city of Tokyo, if that might help their mental health and perhaps even their physical health. And so these doctors did. They started taking people outside of the city to a dense forested area and took them through a mindful practice where they were able to just take the natural surroundings in through the various senses. And they started with typically a couple of days for their experience, sometimes a two night, three day excursion. And as they were doing this, they took a number of, did a number of tests on their subjects, so to speak, to see if it really did have any benefit. And so they did questionnaires asking the participants about various mental health symptoms, whether they noticed that they felt any better with regard to their self-esteem or their vigor or depression or anxiety or things like that. They asked them about their concentration levels and things. And then they also even did tests on their blood pressure and pulse and their heart rate variability. And even then started looking at uh, markers of stress like salivary cortisol and salivary alpha amylase. And they found that they were seeing benefits after taking people out into nature in this mindful, quiet, contemplative way um, and found that it, that it benefited them both mentally and physically. So that's pretty incredible. You're a guide. You guide people on these forest bathing experiences. What does that mean? Why can't you just walk in the forest by yourself and get this benefit? Or well, can of course you? We can, yeah, of course we can just walk in the forest and get these benefits. And I would say that probably anybody who's ever done that has noticed some benefits, whether they sleep better at night or um, that they just feel more refreshed afterwards. But yes, this notion of a guided walk is similar to the way that you wouldn't just embark on a yoga practice without some sort of a teacher. And so that's kind of the idea that a guide can help kind of open the doors to this experience. And so, so a man named Amos Clifford uh, brought the practice to the United States and started formalizing it a little bit more and training guides in this practice and founded the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy. And so with the practice, with a guide, then it is just that. We take people out into nature. It doesn't have to be in a forest. It can be in the desert, for example, in Tucson even. Um, it can be in any kind of natural environment. But the idea being that the guide then helps to take people from their everyday monkey mind, stressed out state into more of a mindful state, even perhaps kind of a dreamlike state. So the idea then is to take people through this practice in a systemic way, helping them, again, take nature in through the various senses. We typically refer to this as invitations, where people are invited to try these different things just to see if it helps to improve their experience. Yeah. You know, Andy, I remember when you wrote Spontaneous Happiness, um, you talked about the importance, you wrote about the importance of going green and being aware that you're a part of nature and that one of the advantages of that awareness was the almost self uh, transcendent experience that you're part of something much larger than yourself. And I wonder if you can talk a little more about that. Yeah, over the years in my work with patients, I frequently wrote down a diagnosis of disconnection syndrome. Uh, that is people who were isolated, that really had lost connections to other people, to animals, to nature, to plants. And uh, I would give them suggestions to remedy that. You know, I don't think you have to live in a forest or go to a forest. Even if you have house plants, companion animals, if you can get out to a park in a city, you know, all those are ways of just realizing you're part of something larger than yourself. I think that's uh, critical for well-being. And we're taping this during the coronavirus pandemic when many people are feeling more isolated than ever. So maybe you can expand a little on some of these ways, as you said, that you can have the advantages of nature without necessarily driving to a national park. Yeah, well, I, I have friends in New York City right now who've had a very hard time over the past uh, months, although things have eased up there. But uh, one of my good friends 
makes a point of going to Central Park every morning and walking for an hour. And that, I think, New York City without Central Park would be a much different place. I mean, that is really a, a big piece of nature right within the city, and it's accessible to everyone. Yeah. And then, you know, you mentioned the much smaller things one can do. And I know, Suzanne, that's been something you've been talking with people about. It really is. I've been thinking about this so much because during this time of the pandemic, we know, I think we know even inherently, intrinsically, that we need nature and we need to get outdoors. And yet, you're right, so many people are in places where going to a park is not possible. And so I've been trying to apply these ideas of forest bathing to the tiniest little examples. And I've been experimenting with it even myself. And that might be as simple as spending time with a, an indoor potted plant. We have a practice in forest bathing called sit spot, where we just take 20 minutes and just sit in nature with no agenda, no expectation to you know, practice a breathing technique or meditate or strike a yoga pose or a prayer or anything like that, but just simply to be in nature for 20 minutes. And I've found that practice to be very powerful. Uh, I typically go out with the expectation that, well, there's nothing to see here. And then of course, immediately I'm just overwhelmed with what happens and what I notice, simply notice in 20 minutes. Journaling afterwards can be very powerful. And so I've applied this during this period of the pandemic to, like I said, the tiniest little unexpected glimpses of nature. And I've experimented with a, an indoor plant. I've experimented looking out the window at my tree out the window for 20 minutes. I've taken myself uh, to some urban uh, areas. In fact, one was a construction zone to see if I could just find some nature solace there. If you have no access to what we consider, you know, big nature during this time, perhaps you can find some nearby nature and find a benefit there. And I, again, I have found that when I journal afterwards, I am able to have an experience. I, I take note of my emotions and my mental state before and after. I'll sometimes even check my pulse. I haven't gotten out my heart math yet to check my heart rate variability, but I need to do that. And I, I do think that we can find nature even in unlikely places right now. So some of what I hear you describing is slowing down, using all your senses, appreciating, reflecting on the experience afterwards. Uh, anything else that you think our listeners might be able to attend to? And, and how is it different than mindfulness? Yeah, I think, I think all of those are the important factors. So mindfulness is this idea that we just witness without attaching any emotion to what we're experiencing, uh, being, being one with nature perhaps. But in forest bathing, instead of not experiencing the full effect, we do celebrate the idea of awe and wonder and connection. I, I find that when people do this, it's impossible not to realize that we're not separate from nature. We are nature. And I find that that's healing just in and of itself. It seems to me that paying attention to nature in some ways is opposite to paying attention to the virtual and artificial reality that comes to us through devices. And that has become a greater and greater factor in people's lives today, even more so during the pandemic. Most definitely. And I think if we can just separate from that, even for short periods of time, we can kind of reset. I think the big concern is that uh, time spent on devices changes brain function, and we don't yet know the full ramifications of that. Uh, there may be some good that comes out of that, but we, we certainly see it undermining attention span. I think it can increase anxiety and anger and contribute to depression. And I, I think we'll have to wait and see how all this plays out. But you know, an awful lot of kids today grow up with a tremendous amount of time on devices, and that's a really new thing in human history. So you mentioned um, a few things that um, forest bathing are thought to specifically counteract, and uh, that includes depression and anxiety. And uh, there are studies uh, that show uh, improvement in uh, mental, emotional well-being. I don't know if there's one in particular, Suzanne, you want to point to. 
Well, there are so many, and I, I just need to um, back up for a second because it has been over 300,000 years of our development and evolution on this planet that humans have been outdoors. It's really only been in the last couple hundred years, less than one, uh, you know, 0.1% of our human experience has been all of this indoor time. And so I think, again, we, we know deep down in our DNA that we need to be outdoors. So I, I very much agree with that whole concept about the too much technology. Uh, there was one study that found that when college students took five minutes disconnected from their devices, being outdoors, they noticed improvement in almost all parameters of mental health. And then when they replicated that study, adding increased durations of time up to 15 minutes, they found that increasing beyond five minutes didn't really have added value. So that's something I share a lot with people, especially kids, just detach, disconnect from your devices, even five minutes a day has benefit. I think it's so astonishing that the dose is so small because right. a lot of times as doctors, when we talk to patients, they say, I don't have time. Right. Uh, that's such a common response when you suggest that people um, exercise, for example. So to be able to say, you know, five minutes spent outdoors, is clearly of benefit across so many studies is I think really exciting and, and heartening. Yeah. You know, and then there was another study that's an excellent study showing that 20 minutes of time improved our salivary cortisol level levels and our salivary alpha amylase levels, which are both markers of the stress response. And, you know, so again, 20 minutes, that's very doable. And again, as they added more time to these studies, they didn't find that necessarily more time had greater benefit. I think the subject is uh, really speaks for itself. And, uh, I think there's many, many ways to do it, but the whole concept of forest bathing, it, 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 I like it. You know, it's a nice idea. And as you know, I spend, I have a forest where I live uh, in British Columbia, so it's right out my back door. You have forest and sea. Forest so have... ocean, but the forest is magnificent. It's 120 acres of mature second growth forest. The trees are about 100 years old, mostly uh, western uh, red cedar and Douglas fir, and it's a fabulous place. A few years ago, there were bad forest fires in British Columbia, and we had a few days when the air was really smoky. I mean, almost to the point that it really felt unhealthy to, to even breathe it at all. And I found that you know, just walking into the forest, it was so much better. You know, you could just feel the oxygen that was coming out of the out of the trees. It just, you know, was a great relief. One of the other experiences I have when I'm in forests, especially with old trees, is the silence. The way the trees almost seem to absorb all sound. And I've had that experience even when my children were little and we would take them camping in the redwoods. And even though there were all these kids running around, shrieking, making a lot of noise, there was this profound silence at the same time. I, I just loved it. There's nothing like that. You know, and I have to throw out there that there is some early evidence out of Japan about this notion of phytoncides, and you may have heard of that, but phytoncides are these chemicals that are emitted from the essential oils of plants, particularly evergreen and pine and redwoods and things. Um, and these phytoncides have all of these amazing properties for the plants where they help to fight and protect the plant and the tree against inflammation and against viruses and bacteria and fungi and so it's now believed that as we're out in a forest that we're inhaling these phytoncides while we're interacting with nature and so that that is thought to confer health benefits on us as well as far as anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial and even uh, there are some studies by dr lee out of japan finding that uh, interacting with these phytoncides and inhaling them into the body increases our natural killer cells in the body. And so these NK cells sweep around the body and gobble up my microbes and also are able to help against the production of tumor cells. And so to, to just imagine that spending time in nature helps us by reducing inflammation, fighting 
viruses and bacteria and other microbes and could even help us against production of tumor cells and against cancer. To me, there's really no better medicine than that. So for each of you, and I'll answer too, what's your favorite tree? I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give us your, your top three. I know. My top tree, my top three trees. This is tough because it changes regularly, <laughs> but um, I love the ponderosa pine. I love the sequoias. And lately I've had a thing for a number of different varieties of oaks. Thank you. What about you, Andy? Oh, that's a really hard one. I would say certainly giant sequoias, uh, ponderosa pines too. And I love to stick my nose in the cracked bark on a hot day and they smell like vanilla. I love uh, that so much. Great vanilla, vanilla trees. Well, I'll share, Scott, some people say. <laughs> I'll share an early uh, fellowship memory. Um, when I was a fellow back in 1998, uh, we had a retreat up on Mount Lemmon, which has many ponderosa pines. And I well remember Andy walking around scratching at the bark so that he could get the scent of the vanilla to emerge. Mm. And all of us fellows sticking our nose up to that ponderosa pine to, to catch a whiff of it. <laughs> that is my favorite thing to do as well. <laughs> Well, my favorite tree is um, a redwood, although I have to say giant sequoias are pretty close. <laughs> Thank you so much, Suzanne, for coming on and for sharing your wisdom about forest bathing. And I hope that our listeners have gotten some ideas, some creative ideas about new ways that they may spend in nature. So uh, maybe if you have a last tip for our listeners, um, just either how to get started or how to be more creative, we'd love to hear it. Sure. Well, there are a number of books on the topic. Um, there are virtual walks being offered all over the place. If people would like to connect with me on that, I'm happy to share more information on how they can do that. But it doesn't have to be difficult. I think the best prescription I could offer would be to just invite people to take the five minutes, the 10 minutes, the 20 minutes, whatever it is, just allow yourself that guilty little pleasure of getting outside and, and spending some time with no agenda. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Listeners, this is Dr. Victoria Mazes. We would love for you to send us your questions for Andy, myself, or for our guests. You can call us and leave a voicemail by dialing 520-621-3950. Again, 520-621-3950. Or you can submit a question by going to our website, azcim.org slash podcast. Again, azcim.org slash podcast. We will review your questions and try to answer as many as possible on our programs. Learn more about topics featured on the Body of Wonder podcast and how to apply them to your everyday health with My Wellness Coach, a free mobile app from the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. Download today at mywellnesscoach.arizona.edu. That's mywellnesscoach.arizona.edu.